what what fascinated me was that at the beginning of your career um you list yourself as a professional musician which we'll touch on a bit later um and that was in the late 70s early 80s but then you very quickly got into the i would say, say the corporate side of or the commercial side of music um with eaton music publishers and then very quickly um had multiple managing director titles um you know, the first one being at Blue Mountain Music and then obviously Ireland after that um, and then onto the publishing side of Ireland and then culminating with you being the managing director of Ireland Records, you know, between 1990 and 1998 at the age of 30, which is embarrassing. Oh, 1990 and 2000, in fact. Oh, right. Okay. Add two years to that. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I see it now. I see it now. Yes. And then um, after that... Um, some of the relationships that you enjoyed and fostered and built um, for many of your artists, uh, probably the most prolific one is you too. Um, and uh, you worked with them and um, you were you were the director and producer on, of the u2.com website, which again, an extraordinary story. And then after that, because you clearly um, are a bit of a masochist and, and love to work particularly hard, um, you, you established a firm called Terra Firma uh, with Correct. Paul Oakenfold and then um, uh, Martin and mine's good friend um, and colleague, um, Dr. Trevor Jones, um, you know, and that was back in 2000. And then you sold the business um, eight years later, um, yep. but, then, but then continued on um, in the entertainment space uh, with, uh, with SEG International as the CEO. And today you find yourself um, as the chairman of uh, Crown Talent and uh, media. No, I'm not. I'm no longer chairman of Crown Talent. Just to, just to be clear. Yes. Um, I, I resigned about six years ago. So I've I've now for the last six years uh, defined myself as a fine artist. Yes. 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 Which will 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 will. That's kind of where we're going to head to from here. But I think the point of just uh, giving that sort of brief overview of your career. Uh, to date, it's um, it's an extraordinary journey that you you know that you've been on. But yeah, I think one of your early mantras was that you were you were going to go above and beyond the expectation of whatever role you were in, um, and that's that has afforded you an extraordinary career. Does that yeah. clearly still applies to you today? Yeah. Well, I mean, if we start at the beginning, Jason. I, I had a I had a false flag near death experience when I was a youngster. Yeah, um, I, I was a professional musician. I started at art college and did the typical thing of joining a band at art college and then basically had to make a decision about where I wanted to go next. And I you, followed you, music. You and Jarvis Cocker. <laughs> yes, absolutely. My my colleague, my former colleague. Exactly. Uh, Clark, um, and what, what happened was that um, I used to define myself as a, as a professional um, musician. And I used to do a bit of gardening as a, um, you know, to, to sort of help make ends meet mm -hmm. because it was a, obviously a very difficult lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, but in reality, I was more a gardener and less a professional musician in those early days. And the trouble is, is that um, I became quite ill and was hospitalized for um, some weeks where they thought that at first that I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, lymphoma and that I was pretty sick with it. Sure. Um, and then when they they um, changed the diagnosis to um, like a childhood leukemia, um, I was about I suppose I was about 21 years old, perhaps at that time. Yeah. Uh, my parents were living in Mauritius and I was kind of very much on my own in hospital. And I didn't want to tell my parents because there was only two flights a week, I think, at that time from Mauritius. And I didn't feel that I wanted them to be disturbed to come back. And. I kind of lay on my own in hospital, um, having been told that if it had been non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, that I was really sick and that um, at, at my age, it was not a good uh, prognosis. Mm. They then uh, eliminated that and then moved it on to, uh, to leukemia. Which is, um, which is not any less, yes, less... No, no less scary. Yeah. So I, I lay in a hospital bed for nearly three weeks, really thinking that this was the end of my life, which was really bizarre as at such a young age. Mm. Um, uh, but eventually they whittled it down to what was at the time a very little known illness, which is now 
very much more understood, um, which was toxoplasmosis, mm. which is uh, which is an amoebic infection of your lymphatic system. Um, and typically it's caught through a cut and catch it in a garden. Yeah. And so that's how I got it. I was a gardener in yeah. reality. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I became, I became, um, so uh, eventually they realized that that could be treated with sort of heavy doses of antibiotics. But I'd had this three week period of thinking life is not a rehearsal it might be over yeah. and you know there is there is a point to this story is is that it really gave me that proper this is not a rehearsal moment you know you've got to get on with your life mm. so um eventually um i was i was so weakened by this illness because it had taken so long to diagnose mm. um that that in fact i could no longer i could hardly um pick up an instrument especially my very heavy double neck guitar <laughs> that i used to play <laughs> Um, and uh, and and also I couldn't pick up a spade, so I couldn't I couldn't work as a gardener or as a, a musician. Um, so my it coincided with my girlfriend and future wife um, Jackie moving to London. So we thought that we would move in together. So I moved to London, um, and I got myself a job working behind the counter in a in a tiny little record store um, for R Price Records. We, we used to call it the R Price Mega Store instead of the Mega Store because it was so small. Um, and, um, and I worked, um, as you would expect, five days a week, always had to work on Saturdays. So I had one day a week off. Um, and I heard a rumor that there was a job going at a music publishing company, Eaton Music, or there was a vacancy coming up. Um, and I um, was encouraged by my future wife and my brother who drove me to the front door, knocked on the door, and then ran and left me standing there. <laughs> and I, uh, and I, and the door was answered. And I said, I, I, I'd really like to apply for the job. And they said, Come in. <laughs> so that was the beginning of my career. So Thank for you. a year, I, I volunteered every Wednesday. Um, um, I, I worked as an intern, I didn't get paid. Um, I just wanted to understand what music publishing was. Mm. Um, and I had the blessing of working with George Fenton and Carl Davis, who were internationally known composers. Yes. And also Eaton Music was, um, was the publisher for um, Status Quo, who I can't pretend I was a fan of, but I became a really big fan of them as human beings. And yeah. I, I learned there that I could work with music that was different to my um, staple prog rock diet at the time, mm. you know. Um, and I and I um, I spent this year just volunteering and learning how it worked. And they were very good. They they had me working in talent scouting, but they also had me working in royalties, in, in plugging, actually going to Radio One and trying to get tracks on the radio and things like that. Um, until such point that they just said that. Um, they, they liked my work attitude, they liked me, I fitted in really well, and they'd like to offer me a full-time job. Well, um, and I've, and I'd, been, I'd been applying for jobs, and I had just got an, an interview with the BBC to become a trainee radio producer. Oh, wow. um, and so I had that interview, and they offered me the job too. So I had two jobs at the same time. The BBC offered me £10,000 a year. This would have been 1981, I think, something like that. Good many, yeah. Yeah, um, and Eaton Music offered me five thousand pounds a year, so half the money, and I took Eaton Music because that's where my heart lay. Yeah, um, and yeah. that's the that's the you know I, I look back on that now and I think what a fortuitous decision that actually was. Yeah, but it was half half the money, but but twice the lifestyle. <laughs> it would be the which, way that I would. Do. Which I which I'd like to think talks to, you know, to to your passion and to your investment in. You know, I think, again, it shows throughout your career that literally from then on, um, the, the level of investment that you, that you put in was from a place of passion. It wasn't, it wasn't from a place of paycheck, for lack of a better word. My entire career has been guided by that and still is. And, it, and that's made life actually quite difficult now. But that is still my guiding principle. Mm. I've got to be doing the right thing. And that's, that's the right thing for me. But also the right thing for music and the musicians that I that I work for, and it's a it's a completely guiding principle. But when we'll move on to Chris Blackwell, but was totally reinforced by Chris Blackwell when I 
joined um, Blue Mountain Music and the Island Group. Mm. But we'll we'll move on to how that happened. So we were the music publishers for um, Carl Davis, who who um, who was um, you know a, a leading film composer, and George Fenton, and they were kind of the staple, um, I would say, bread and butter clients for for the music publishing company. Um, and I happened to work on um, a, a film, a movie, um, which Carl Davis had scored um, called Champions. Um, mm. And it was about a particular um, jockey who, it's a true story, it's about a jockey who overcame cancer and I think he won the Derby twice or, or the Grand National, maybe the Grand National twice. Yeah. Yeah. So once pre-cancer, got his cancer diagnosis, recovered and then won the, won the Grand National a second time. Um, and in it was a traditional score, but it had a song at the end, which was a song by Elaine Page, the, who was quite successful at the time. Yeah, very much. And Island Records had the soundtrack rights to it. I was the music publisher. Mm. They were the record company. Um, and they were having real difficulty, even though the film was a, a kind of minor art hit, mm. uh, they were having difficulty. They're having difficulty getting any traction with with any of the music on on radio. Mm -hmm. um, but I came up with a really interesting idea, which and could, this was my total naivety. I didn't know what I was allowed to do or what could be done or whatever. You didn't know, um, but in my, <laughs> exactly in my in my twenty three year old naivety, I approached the BBC and I I suggested with the Grand National coming up on the agenda, mm -hmm. bearing in mind at that time probably 15 million people watched it in the UK. Mm. Um, I suggested to them that Elaine Page might be invited to sing the song at the opening of the, uh, of the race, pre-race, and they said yes. So they, they took her up to um, the Grand National, uh, I think it was Aintree, mm -hmm. um, and she performed the song in front of 15 million people. The, the single was a, was a minor hit, but it, it, it sold the soundtrack album, it got things moving. Yes. And then the interesting thing was, was that the, the guy who ran um, that division of the island label, mm -hmm. Nick Stewart, mm -hmm. um, was, he was the person who personally signed you too. So he was the guy who signed you too. He was just being promoted into the head of, head of talent, head of A&R at Island Records. So he needed somebody to replace himself. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to be on his agenda because I'd done this great thing. Um, and so he interviewed me, um, he uh, invited me out for lunch. Uh, we got on really well. And then at lunch, he offered me um, the job to come in as general manager of Blue Mountain Music to replace him as he moved into Island yeah. Records yeah. Um, and offered me 10,000 pounds a year. So I was, so, so, so two years later, I'm back up to 10,000 pounds a year. And I'm thinking, but I accepted there and then. Yes. Um, because I, I, um, un, unknown to Nick, I had been a huge Island devotee, and in particular, Chris, Chris Blackwell devotee. Mm. I'd been collecting Island's records, and I had in particular been collecting Chris's productions of Grace Jones and Bob Marley and Free and people like that, that mm. um, because I, I had this enduring love of the label. And so the opportunity of working for Chris Blackwell's personal company, because Blue Mountain was not part of the island group. Yeah. Blue Mountain belonged personally to Chris Blackwell. There's a big definition there. So it was a very personal thing for him. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, is that Nick hadn't sought authority from Chris to employ anyone. And Chris was furious that I'd been employed. And the reason that he was furious um, was because um blue mountain being a personal company to him he felt that it was his decision about who should run his company so chris notoriously only ever came into the uk perhaps perhaps one month a year yes um i started in the may and chris would normally come in the good weather so he'd come in july yes so two months later um, i didn't know that chris had told nick to get rid of me um and Nick had not done so. Nick had refused to get rid of me. And so Chris came into the country and then I got this call saying, would I go out to his personal home in Thiel near Reading in, in the UK mm -hmm. um, for a Saturday meeting? And that meeting, he, Chris admitted to me later he was going to fire me. So I went out there, but in the, in the preceding months from May to July, I had done this awesome job 
of going through every one of, 20, of the 22,000 songs that Blue Mountain owned. Um, you know, I, I, I could see from the PRS registration what we owned, but we didn't have copies of the music. You know, we didn't have records. We didn't have, we didn't have the sounds of it. And I had um, collated it all. I'd collected it. I'd, 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 there was no digitization, but I put it all onto, onto tape, onto cassette. Um, and then I had written copious notes in a Rolodex about this song is suitable for Paul Young, for Alison Moyer. I'm going to send this song to Cher. This song needs to go to uh, Elaine Page. This song, you know. So yeah. I had done this huge amount of work. And again, not knowing that Chris was going to fire me, I took all of the work with me. And I showed him what I'd done with, in my enthusiasm. Anyway, we got on really, really well. I think that he saw me in him, mm. um, Dali, and that's because my, I'm the son of a Mauritian father. Mm. Uh, he, he, uh, uh, and in particular, I'm the son of a Mauritian colonel, and he was the son of a Jamaican military father, and he called us small islanders, so we were both small islanders. Yeah. Um, and also, I was quite a rare um, commodity in the music industry, forgetting my enthusiasm, but I was a public school boy, and mm. so was he. I was he was major public school Gordonston. I was a minor public school boy, but we were both kind of posh boys in a, in an industry where there weren't very many posh boys really. Yeah. Um, and I I now look back on that and I think actually there was like a connection there that he he thought that he could work with me. And so I I, I stayed the Saturday with him, did what I did, went home, and then on the Monday morning, um, the uh, the the chief accountant for the company, John Leftley, called me and he said. Well, you had a good weekend. And I said, yes, what do you mean? He said, Chris has made you managing director and you're on £25,000 a year. Uh, <laughs> from, <laughs> from basically <clears throat> being on the edge of a cliff, unbeknownst to you, to basically getting double, more than double your salary. Um, well, I'd gone from 5000 to 25000 I mean, it's, so, it's a bit gauche to talk about money, but it's actually quite an interesting part of the journey. Yes. Um, and I've gone from that in, in this sort of two year period, um, thinking this is easy. The music business is easy. <laughs> but I mean, to your earlier point, you your passion drove you. You landed up doing all of this work that no one had asked you to do, but you, you took the initiative. You didn't ask permission. As you say, naivety, um, ignorance, call it what you will. It's um, kind of saved the day. But throughout that journey, to that point, it really was about particular people and you making connections with, with those people who were driving the business. But then once you were given the keys to the castle, you applied that same principle to every act that you worked on. Uh, I, I, absolutely, and I, and I will go into that, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take you back to Eton music and getting into trouble for my enthusiasm. Just one little story where, where um, uh, um, um, Mercury Records delivered the new status quo single to, to us. Mm -hmm. uh, it hadn't come out yet. It hadn't been launched, but it, we got the physical copies. And my boss, Terry Oates said, why don't you just go down to Radio One and see if you can get it played? And I thought, yeah, I'll do that. So I went and had an interview with Paul Gambaccini, who was a Radio One DJ of some importance at the time. And he, um, he said, yeah, yeah, I'll play it. And he put it on the radio that day. So, that, so there was a worldwide premiere. And I thought, fuck, I have, I have done a worldwide premiere. Mercury Records were so furious with me. You have no idea. Because they had a whole launch campaign planned. And they had already promised it to, I don't know, some other DJ, you know. Um, and there was a whole launch campaign. And I had blown it completely. And I'd gone like a week early. Um, you know, they weren't ready. The stop was, you know, oh, yeah. goodness me. So, so I'm just saying that my enthusiasm sometimes bit me on the ass. Chris Blackwell told me years later, the problem with being a pioneer is you often get your ass full of arrows. And I did yeah. that day. Yeah. But I mean, <clears throat> I'm sure it was a, a very quick uh, learning curve, one that you um, <laughs> quickly respect yeah. the platform that you didn't know existed before. But <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, I, I, I learned from it. But going back to, to Chris, so, so when I was running Blue Mountain, um, you know, a, a few notable things happened. Um, I had a very small uh, talent budget, so, so to be able to sign acts, I, I could spend £50,000 a year on, on discovering talent. Um, but I soon found that um, I think through um, two things, 
credibility as a former musician mm. for me to be able to talk to musicians mm. and also just through personality, you know. Mm. Um, the, um, I, I found that I was able to put myself in a position to sign acts that were way above my budget. So, you know, even though there may have been competition for those acts, um, you know, I, I was able to bring the talent in. Um, mm. And the, the first, um, the, I think the first one that I brought in was an act signed to 4AD Records, a fantastic independent label, uh, which was a band called Colorbox. Um, I know it well. We, I know it we, well. Yeah. Sorry. Um, the, <clears throat> the track that you obviously are, you know, can actively claim as, you know, there are a raft of them that you can. But yes, 4AD being an, a, an extraordinary label, the intention I think with, with 4AD was always that the artists, the development artists would start at 4AD, they would then be promoted to Beggar's Banquet. And that's, that's correct, yeah. And that was the commercial component of the business, um, you know, where the money really was gonna be made to fuel yeah. the development acts. But then you took that song, <clears throat> Pump Up the yeah. Volume, and so you were responsible for breaking that? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to claim responsibility for things that I didn't do. <laughs> I, I, it, was, it was Ivo Watts Russell at 4AD, who owned 4AD, yes. that put uh, A.R. Kane, which was, I think, one of his acts, yeah. and Colourbox together to say, let's see what you can do together. Yeah. And, and they came up with Pump Up the Volume. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I had acquired the rights. It had been a £15,000 signing, I remember... That, that's how much it costs to acquire um, Colourbox's worldwide publishing. Um, and then the, 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 what came out of that was a, a number one single in 16 countries. That was huge. Um, Absolutely. But, but also, most importantly, I had persuaded Chris to sign the record rights for North America. Wow. And it became, I think it may have even become the first number one single for Island Records in its history in America. So it had it had significant importance for the label, yeah. and I was definitely seen as the person that had done that. And by this time, I'm probably 24, 25 years old, something oh, yeah. like that. Yeah. And so Chris, Chris's trust in me was was repaid. Is is really what I'm saying? But the, um, at, at, sorry, but 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 the question begs to be asked: Is that what made you do that? What was the trigger where you believed spending £15,000 was a good idea? Well, listen, th th there is a backstory to that. There was a very, very hot act at the time um, in the UK um, called the Roaring Boys. And they had been on the front cover of the Sunday Times Culture Supplement um, without even having a record deal. They were that hot. Um, and they were considered to be the hottest band in the UK. And I persuaded them to sign to Little Old Blue Mountain Music, except I, they, they had, um, I had, they were competing offers from everybody, all the majors, all the majors. And I was this tiny little indie, mm. uh, but they wanted me to match the lowest offer, which was 200,000 mm. pounds. And I had a 50,000 pound annual budget. So Chris asked me to fly to New York with him, uh, to, to him, to make the case. Mm. So I took the music, um, and they were kind of a Duran Duran clone, and Duran Duran were massive at the time. I took the music to New York and I made the case, and um, I thought that they had at least two big hits on the record, um, and I thought that, I, that they were good. They were interesting Cambridge graduate public school boys, and I think that's why they liked me, maybe. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to put too much on the, on the posh boy thing, but... No, but, but, I, think, um, but I, I think it illustrates the point that they're... It, in all the success that you've had, it's it's besides obviously having an ear, knowing you know, and being deeply invested in all of the the back end of what what makes makes the industry what it is. There was definitely a um, a personal connection and a and a collective passion that people yes. saw in you, um, and that was the difference between them going left or right. And correct, but here's the thing though. I go to New York, I present the case to Chris, um, and um, he knows this is a significant um, a difference in budget. You know, he knows that. Mm. He tells me that he's prepared. Um, so we, we'll come back on in 10 minutes, okay? Yes, that'd be great, thank you. Yeah. Um, um, so he knows there's a significant budget implication, but he says that he'll back me. And then he says, he asks me, he said, but do you, 
like it? And I said, well, there's two hits on it, but I wouldn't listen to it at home. It's and awesome. he said, he said, you're gambling your entire career on something that you wouldn't listen to at home. He said, I think you're met you're guilty of two things. I said, I think you've fallen in love with the deal rather than the band. The fact that you can get it is an ego massage. Yeah. This is what he told me. Um, he said, I want you to really think about that on your flight home to the UK. Um, and, and he said also, you, you're justifying it on the basis that it sounds like Duran Duran and it fits into the zeitgeist. He said, but if you do that, you're judging it against records that were in the gestation for the last three years. They're already out of date. He said, you've got to stop listening to the radio. And I said, what do you mean, stop listening to the radio? He said, if you, if you live your life listening to the radio, in his opinion, you'll, you'll be influenced by decisions that were made three years ago. You need to be thinking about decisions that are going, you need to make decisions that are based upon what in three years time radio will be listening to. He said, no, what? He, said, he said, I don't want you to gamble your career, but he said, if, if this fails, your career is over pretty much. So I don't want you to gamble your career on it, I, but I will back you. I want you to think about it on the flight home. And I got home and I canceled the deal and they were furious with me. Yeah. And then the next signing was Colourbox, £15,000. You see. Because I loved Colourbox and I would listen to it at home. Which, just, which then says that your ear <clears throat> was attuned to being able to, to break hits in a commercial way. And I mean, that applies to, you know, I mean, again, let's run the list, you know, whether it was Pulp or whether it was U2 or um, give me some names here, Mark, there's so many. Uh, PJ Harvey, Tricky, Nine Inch Nails, NWA, yes. um, you know, um, a massive attack. Yes. Um, you know, th these 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 were things I loved. Elbow, I loved. You but know. also it's incredibly diverse. I mean, you know, you take Guy Garvey and Elbow, and then you go and take Nine Inch Nails, which in a, in a British uh, context, yes, it, it, it was huge in 1994, um, certainly when Closer came out. But um, <clears throat> such a diverse... You, you know your Jason, I really appreciate that. That's great. And I've, I've been a fan of, of your work, unbeknownst until recently. Um, you know, in the same way that you were passionate about Island Records, I was very loyal to particular labels growing up, and I've been a music fan for forty odd years. And I actually did have the the, the well, the rare privilege of spending time with Ivor Watts Russell back in the mid nineties, um, because Four AD was my my ultimate indie label. But yet, Island to me and Antilles and the various offshoots of the you know, of the broader label, um, I've always had huge respect for. So yes, I'm a bit of a fan yeah. boy. <laughs> so I apologize yeah. for that. Um, <clears throat> so let's go back, let's go back to, to Blue Mountain Music. Yes. Um, so I would say, actually, uh, so, so the, the decision to, to sign Colorbox was probably, you know, one of the most pivotal decisions of, of my career, so young and so early, yeah. because effectively it put me on the map, you know? Uh, but prior to that, there had been one signing, Dr. Trevor Jones. So your relationship with him goes back that far? To 1984, um, because I, eight, maybe 85. And the reason for that was that I had come out of Eaton Music and I had learned the power of George Fenton and Carl Davis. Mm -hmm. And I'd also really began to understand the money that they were able to generate because they because one thing that Eaton Music was very good at doing was retaining the copyright to the composers rather than letting the film company take them, which is what typically was happening in those days. Right. Um, and I'd seen The Dark Crystal and I thought that Trevor's score was superb. I really thought it was fantastic. Mm. So I did a bit of research on him and, and um, found that he was a bit in the doldrums. I, I hope that Trevor won't take offence at any of this. Um, but he was in the doldrums um, and it was, it was the most for the most obvious reason and that was was that he'd filled his diary with money paying uh, mortgage covering work that was of low value whereas dark crystal was a very high value international value yeah. um, and so i signed trevor um, i became friends with him and victoria uh, very very quickly um, and i signed trevor to to um to, to blue mountain music 
actually to a subsidiary called Island Visual Arts that I'd created to yeah. to, to cover. cover uh, in fact, it was it was designed by me to cover the acquisition of film copyright. That's what I wanted, TV and film. Enya was one of my first signings to IVA, but, but not only for one project, which was yeah. a BBC sign. Um, so with Trevor um, and Victoria, I went through his diary and I got them to cross out all of the penciled in small beer stuff, I called it. So yeah. it was all all covering his beer bills yeah. um, and cigarette bills, knowing Trevor. Um, and, um, and and I said, give me space in your diary to go out and find something for you. This is how naive I was. I can't believe it. But myself and my, uh, by this time, I'd appointed a general manager, Richard Manners, mm. um, who went on to become the chairman of Warner Music in the UK, Warner Publishing in the UK. Uh, but Richard and I went out and we started trawling around all the film production companies, uh, pushing Trevor and his score for The Dark Crystal. Um, and Trevor at one point got very agitated with me because there wasn't enough money coming in because I'd cleared his diary. Yes, yeah. um, but then the very next thing um, that, 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 we, that we got was um, Alan Parker's um, Angel, Heart. Um, mm. Angel Heart. Yeah. And we got that for Trevor. And it was like, you know, yeah. I, I really felt that I had done my job, you know, yeah. first time where I felt I'd done my job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, of course, then led to Alan Parker giving him Mississippi Burning. Mm. And then eventually that led to The Last of the Mohicans that led to, you know, the, effectively the, the, the roller coaster of Trevor becoming an international film composer. And, and my enduring friendship and love of Trevor and vice versa, because we are really close friends, comes out of... Um, I think uh, helping him because it's all his genius, yeah. but it was helping him have to find a platform for his genius on an international stage. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Uh, otherwise, he would have just simply waited for Jim Henson to create another film, and then that might have happened, but it might have been five, ten years hence. Who knew? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so, so, um, so that was the early days. Um, and, um, and also, you know, Chris Blackwell could see that too. So, so he could see that, he could see pump up the volume. Uh, the next thing that happened is that um, Richard and I signed the band James, who were signed to Factory Records. Yeah. Uh, and, they, and they had the hit um, Sit Down. I think it was yeah. released three or four times before yes. it became the hit that it became. Yes. So I was kind of on a roll. I signed, then I signed Tone Loke. I was interested in, in black and urban music and I signed uh, Tone Loke. Mm. Um, had, had a couple of hits with, with him yeah. and I was kind of off to the races with Blue Mountain mm. but with Island Visual Arts um, this is, is interesting because this goes back to one of our early points about which which is which is about naivety but in a way it's aligned to entrepreneurship mm. um, because I started thinking that I was I owed my career to Chris. I, I really loved working with him. Mm. And he I, I know he loved working with me. I, I, Any time that he was in the UK, I would spend a lot of time with him. He'd get me out to America to spend time with him. All the time, he was mentoring me without me knowing. Yeah. He, you know, I was a good mentee because I was a sponge absorbing it all. Yeah, you were but he was giving me the lessons of his career. Mm. And, when, and there was a point where I thought, what can I do for him? And um, I had this sort of loose IVA... Um, company structure um, and I had learned that we had had a quite a well-known um, filmmaker called Scott Mullaney who had who had at one point been Chris's driver and um, and had persuaded Chris to invest in some camera gear so we could start filming free or we could start filming traffic or we could whatever mm. and we had all of these films that nobody had ever exploited so we owned things, things like um, U2 live at Red Rocks, never exploited. We owned even Dame Kiri Takanawa's first ever Royal Command performance at um, the Royal Albert Hall in front of the Queen. How? How did we? But we owned them. We owned free. Um, we owned a free um, 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 live concert. We owned all, all sorts of different things yeah. that they never exploited. Um, and I'd spotted that there was a, a burgeoning um, sell-through VHS market for music yeah. program. Yeah. So I catalogued again. I went 